All right, welcome to our last session in the public lecture series of the Amsterdam Center for Religion, Peace and Justice Studies 2022. Uh, it is great to have with us tonight Dr. Elaine Enns from California and together with her partner and colleague Chad Myers. Elaine has worked in a range of restorative justice fields since 1989, from victim-offender dialogue in the criminal justice system to healing of historical violations and intergenerational trauma. Elaine trains and teaches throughout North America and most recently co-authored with her partner and activist theologian Chad Myers, Healing Haunted Histories, A Settler Discipleship of Decolonization, which was published by Wilton Stock in 2021. She was raised and born, she was born and raised in Saskatchewan, Canada. Elaine lives now in Southern California, where she also co-directs Bartimeo's Cooperative Ministries on traditional too much land. Welcome so much. We have invited you to speak in this uh, public lecture series on Mennonite innocence, uh, what we call Mennonite innocence, uh, a topic that has carried us through the past uh, five sessions dealing with violence and guilt in a peace church. So it is quite a challenging topic and a series of topics that we have uh, seen so far. And here comes another one on trauma, white privilege and innocence, Mennonites and settler colonialism on the Canadian prairies. Well, Elaine, Chet, thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom tonight with us and uh, a warm welcome to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando and Andreas and Setka. It is so lovely uh, to see you and all of you that are here tonight. It is wonderful um, to be in conversation with you again. Uh, I am beaming to you from the little town of Oakview in Southern California bioregion. And this is the heart, as Fernando was mentioning, the heart of traditional and unceded Chumash territory, a community and legacy to which Chad and I as settlers are here are responsible. And this place and Cree territory in Saskatchewan, where I was born and raised, are the uh, primary contexts we investigate in our new book. And that's what I'll talk from tonight. But before beginning, I want to also acknowledge three European landscapes to which I have made pilgrimages over the past 12 years, which have also uh, influenced my approach. In 2010, my oldest sister and I went on a Mennonite heritage tour and we traveled up the Dnieper River in Ukraine, visiting the former homes of my grandparents and earlier ancestors and metabolizing in a new way, their community's stories of joy and trauma. And the fact that the violence they experienced from a Russian war on Ukrainian soil is occurring again. 100 years later, which I know weighs heavily on all of us tonight. In 2010, Chad and I on our way home from Palestine, where we looked in a harsh mirror of settler colonialism, we stopped in Switzerland and made a pilgrimage to the holy ground of the Tefahola, and that you know is the cave where many early Anabaptists took refuge. And then in 2018, we had the wonderful opportunity to be with Fernando, Andreas, Daniel, and Sepka at the Free University in Amsterdam, and where we workshopped some of the material that ended up in this book. And I recall, and I can't remember the pastor's name of the, of the famous Mennonite church, uh, greeting me warmly and saying, you are an ENS, you are from here welcome home. So it was a wonderful, uh, warm greeting. And then Sepka took us on a tour of Friesland and we saw Menno Simon's place of origins. And it really um, was a wonderful trip that uh, influenced us a great deal. So these three pilgrimages shaped and prodded my thinking about landlines, bloodlines, and songlines, which became the basic architect uh, of this book 
and it was a 12 year project which was published early last year and so again it has been very nice to listen in on your european conversation over the course of this series half of which ched and i have been able to attend we appreciated how last week Regina and Tobin, who are our old friends, Chad actually wrote the foreword to their first anti-racism book, moved the focus of the series from critical deconstruction of Mennonite innocence to engagement for transformation. And I think it's fair to say that the excellent papers given in this series have decisively dismantled our communal myth of innocence. But changing our personal and political culture is a long labor. Our outline of a discipleship of decolonization focuses on practices to face and heal from the hauntings of our history. As descendants of a Mennonite story that was entangled, however unwittingly, in the European conquest of the world. So in these few minutes, I'll first unpack this notion that ghosts inhabit our landlines, bloodlines, and songlines as a way of framing the colonial dis-ease among us and within us all under settler colonialism. And then second, I'll introduce our idea of post-colonial discipleship as restorative solidarity. And these two themes represent the bookends of our narrative. So what do we mean by hauntings? To illustrate, we need to look no further than the murder of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman two years ago next week. It brought up yet again the ghosts of a long-standing history of violence towards black and brown bodies in our white dominant American body politic. This powerful haunting spread across time and space, even as far away as war torn Syria. And of course, the ghosts continue to arise. Just this last Saturday, I'm sure you heard in Buffalo, New York, an 18 year old white supremacist murdered 10 people at a supermarket in a black neighborhood. And we may recoil in horror but we will continue to endure such acts of madness until we face the hauntings of racism past and present. And there are even deeper hauntings. Exactly one year after George Floyd's murder, Canada began confronting excru excruciating uncoveries. The Tecamloops de Suetmuch First Nation announced that ground penetrating radar had identified the remains of some 200 unmarked grave sites of children at Kamloops Indian Residential School in BC. This began a growing tally of similar sites at other residential schools across Canada, including in my home province of Saskatchewan. For more than a century, these mostly church administered boarding schools attempted to assimilate the indigenous children and undermine their culture, to kill the Indian in order to save the child, in the infamous words of one Canadian official in 1920. In the wake of these discoveries came protests, children's shoes and toys on the steps of a Catholic church, and on a statue of Pope Jane, John Paul II outside another church, small handprints in red paint and the phrase, we were children. The United States also ran federally, runded board, federally funded boarding schools during this same period, half of which were administered by churches. Interior Secretary Deb Holland, she is Laguna Pueblo, just two weeks ago released a report whose findings show that such burial sites have also been identified. It is a time of reckoning with the ghosts of a genocidal past, especially for our churches. American sociologist Avery Gordon in her important book, Ghostly Matters, asserts that haunting 
is a constituent element of modern, li modern social life through which repressed or unresolved social violence makes itself known in everyday life, especially when they are supposedly over and done with, slavery for instance, or when their oppressive nature is continuously denied. Importantly, Gordon also emphasizes how reckoning with these ghosts can mobilize individual, social, or political movement and change, but only if they are faced. Let me offer a def definition of settler colonialism from two Canadian researchers. They write, Settler colonialism is a distinct type of colonialism that functions through the replacement of indigenous populations with an invasive settler society that over time develops a distinctive identity and sovereignty. Settler colonial states include Canada, the United States, Australia, and South Africa. In classic colonialism, for example, India, Indonesia, much of Africa, Europeans came to extract resources, labor, and wealth, and to dominate the majority native, native populations, but did not try to eliminate them. But in settler colonialism, as Patrick Wolf puts it, Europeans came to stay on an expropriated land base. And we, their descendants, continue the pattern of resettling across the landscape, having claimed ownership of the land and its resources. Indigenous scholar Eve Tuck characterizes this project as the management of those who have been made killable and names it as the oldest and longest haunted history in North America. Indeed, the last half millennium has left a legacy of violation and genocide that inhabits every intersection of settler and indigenous worlds past and present, which is deeply woven into the fabric of our personal and political consciousness. And unless and until this legacy is faced and healed, there will always be more ghosts to return. Our book looks at the deepest layers of hauntings and injustices in North American settler societies in order to encourage challenge and capacitate settler Christians and other people of faith and conscious to first understand how our histories, landscapes, and communities are haunted by the long and continuing history of Indigenous dispossession wrought by settler colonialism, two, to transform the self-understandings, life ways, and structures that we inhabit, and three, to practice restorative solidarity with Indigenous communities. We call this work a discipleship of decolonization, which we believe is a thoroughly Anabaptist project. We of course long for all of our faith communities to be places where we white settlers can nourish, nurture the courage to face and engage the many layers of hauntings. Work we characterize as like peeling an onion with all the accompanying tears. We need to learn to feel the pain of our entanglement in racism and colonization, past and present. The emotional labor of indigenous black and brown folks having to share their pain so we can get it is too costly. Our work cannot be sustained on other people's wounds nor on their strength. So a discipleship of decolonization is our onion to peel. An important part of our approach is to critically trace our family and communal histories in order to understand how we also carry the wounds of violence and dispossession, sometimes as victims, sometimes as perpetrators, no matter how unwittingly, and sometimes both. We discuss tools for exploring our storylines, tracing and analyzing place, people, and spirit to name and heal these ghosts. As mentioned earlier, we refer to these strands of communal narratives as landlines, mapping past and present places of inhabitation to understand how we are shaped by and shapers of 
those places for good and for ill. Bloodlines, family and community, race and ethnicity, focusing on what trauma and entanglement we carry in our bones, and songlines, the liberative traditions of faith and conscious, conscience that inspire practices of justice and compassion among our people. And we invite readers to explore, interrogate, and decolonize these strands using my family and communal storylines as a working example. The backbone narrative of the book is about my Ruslander grandparents and their communities' flight from Russia and Ukraine in the wake of the Bolshevik and Stalinist violence, and then their settlement on the Canadian prairies in the 1920s. And we explore how over the centuries, Anabaptist dissent, displacement, and periodic persecution marginalized our people on one hand, but on the other, Mennonite leaders adapt at negotiating certain privilegia from the colonial powers, which often implicated us in the colonial project and accelerated our assimilation into white advantages over time. And of course, Ben Goosen spoke about one expression of this phenomenon when he described how MCC worked in connection with leaders of the Third Reich, helping Mennonite refugees get to Canada. In Saskatchewan, my traumatized refugee Ruslander ancestors settled on the prairies, where Mennonite farmers were actively being recruited by the Canadian government as a buffer population as part of a, of a domestication project. In this process, nearby Indigenous communities were displaced, adding to their far greater traumatization from ongoing colonial policies of violence and suppression. So here on the Canadian prairies, two haunted communities struggled to survive side by side, but with little connection between them. The Mennonite settlement of Saskatchewan is of course just one episode in the colonization of an entire continent on which today Indigenous peoples occupy only 0.2% of land mass that used to be theirs. Our work as descendants and beneficiaries of this legacy of settler colonialism is to understand and engage our own entanglements white supremacist structures today. The word complicit derives from the Latin complicare, meaning to be entangled, which we all are. Michael Rothberg's important 2019 book argues that when it comes to historical violence and contemporary inequality, none of us are completely innocent. We may, be not, not, we may not be direct agents of harm, but we may still contribute to, inhabit, or benefit from regimes of domination that we neither set up nor control. He argues that, quote, the familial categories of victim, perpetrator, and bystander do not adequately, adequately account for our connection to injustices past and present. And he offers a new theory of political responsibility through the figure of the implicated subject. This way of framing resonates with our approach and we commend it for conversations going forward. There simply is no innocence among settler colonists and their descendants, only implicated subjects. So this brings us to the topic of Mennonite presumptions of innocence. Like other North American settlers, we try to avoid the implications of our implication. Here, I'll just briefly summarize key strategies of avoidance. The most typical one is what three Canadian scholars call colonial agnosia. This is not, they argue, a matter of collective amnesia or omission. Rather, this act of ignoring is aggressively reproduced, effectively invested, meaning it inhabits our emotions and spirituality and effectively dis distributed through our educational systems and media in a way that justifies the status quo 
and renders our entanglements in colonization as just too difficult to understand. In other words, we settlers don't know about past and continuing injustices, and we don't want to know. Another widespread strategy is dissociation, embracing an ahistorical individualism in which we settlers understand ourselves as free-floating entities, untethered and unaccountable to a past which is not our fault. Two other Canadian theorists call this transcendent denial, a foreclosure of knowledge in which the settler must believe that history is in the past and that any and all harm, trauma, and associated accountability is irrelevant. As a result, they assert, we are literally sick at heart and soul, making it difficult to look at each other or ourselves without weariness which extends to all those we encounter as other. In our book, we build upon Eve Tuck's idea of settler innocence. The two strategies just mentioned represent the basic ideological structure that runs deeply through our settler culture. But there are other moves to innocence, which I'll point out briefly here, along with some of their unique expression among Mennonites. For example, Mennonites exercise not only personal dissociation, but a kind of communal exceptionalism in which we claim that because we as a church have separated ourselves from the state, we are not morally responsible for its acts of violence. But Tobin reminded us last week of Vincent Harding's words in 1967 at the Mennonite World Conference in Amsterdam. And to paraphrase, you have received a theology that rejects violence and distances from power, but that rejection has made you blind to how you participate in this power. And this leads to a third move to innocence, a reluctance to talk about ways we settlers have been privileged by or benefited from settler colonialism. People will often profess, for example, that we don't, they don't know how their family acquired land or wealth. It just came to us. It is often simply presumed as an entitlement. And a particular way in which inheritance without responsibility is practiced among settler Mennonites is our failure to acknowledge the many ways that our immigrant ancestors were recipients of racial preferences, economic advantages, and armed protection from the colonizing state. Last weekend, we participated in a conference hosted by Conrad Grable University in Canada, in which paper after paper documented how Mennonite settlers were given indigenous land, enjoyed legal exemptions, and were directly or indirectly defended by state militias. Other moves to innocence move from socialized unknowing to contrived or selective ways of knowing. Here are four typically found among political conservatives. If these folks allow that colonization might have resulted in some violence or dispossession, they immediately rationalize such unfortunate outcomes as either unavoidable or inevitable, claiming that this is just the march of civilization. Others assert explicitly that because European settlers were technologically and culturally superior, they were destined to prevail. The Mennonite version of this is a narrative of moral superiority. Last week, Regina pointed out that our hagiography of Mennonite service and global multicultural connections do not exonerate us from our implication in the history of colonization and white supremacy. Another move to innocence is the classic distinction between intent and impact. It was never our intent to destroy Native culture. In fact, we were just trying to civilize them. Now, Robin DiAngelo contends that distinguishing intent from impact is the foundation of white fragility in a racialized culture. 
a particularly odious strategy is called victimization. Privileged people playing the victim card. Now this is gaining ground among white nationalists today who argue that white oppression is as bad or worse than that of communities of color. The ideology that whites are being replaced by immigrants of color growing both in Europe and North America is what motivated the shooter in Buffalo last week. A particular Mennonite twist on victimization is that we don't often see our complicity because of a communal phenomenon called egoism of victimization. Social psychologist John Mack observed that in groups who have experienced trauma, yet exhibit little or no empathy for others' losses, even if the victimization on the other side is palpably comparable to or greater than one, one's own. We Mennonites steward a narrative of special martyrdom, settler Mennonites, and it becomes a lens through which we view our periodic sufferings of the past century. Carolyn Yoder has pointed out that often Mennonite pain is so great, we are blind to see how we harm or oppress others. And this attitude was exhibited by one of my Ruslander interviewees who told me, we experience violence too. Why can't native people just pull themselves up by their bootstraps? I want to focus in on this issue for just a moment. I do not wish to ignore or downplay the violence that early Anabaptist or other Mennonites have endured. One historian described what my Ruslander ancestors experienced this way. Between 1917 and 1921, they survived a continuous climate of violence, plundering, rape, mass killing, and extensive bloodbaths. End quote. So in our book, we discuss how trauma can be transmitted intergenerationally through both nurture and nature. Linda Claus and Reynolds investigated the psychological effects of trauma among Ruslan immigrants and found that each of the three generations from survivor to grandchildren exhibited significantly higher than normal levels of anxiety, depression, and other mental illness. And I can attest to these patterns in my own extended family. In addition to attending to the intergenerational trauma in our communities, however, we Mennonites must also reckon with moral injury. Defined as a particular type of trauma that may develop following a perceived moral violation where a person perpetrates fails to prevent or witnesses events that contradict deeply with their held moral beliefs and expectations. And it's pictured here in this chart. So this is an important framework for those of us who are implicated subjects in the violence of settler colonialism and con conquest right up to the present. A half century ago, Canadian Mennonite sociologist Leo Dreger put the matter plainly in the Mennonite Quarterly Review. Quote, when hunters and trappers had been cleared away in both Russia and Canada, Canada, Mennonites moved in. It was a struggle between the food gatherers and the food growers. The Mennonites were part of the farming invasion. How, he continued, could non-resistant Mennonite minorities benefit from lands and protection secured by government through war and violence without compromising their basic principles? This question of moral injury haunts us still. These are hard issues and I'm grateful for the survivance and resistance of my ancestors. Yet, our long-term health as a community requires us to explore how we were and are entangled in colonial policies of white supremacy, extraction and oppression, and how to make things right with our indigenous neighbors. And I know all too well how this bloodlines work 
can sometimes feel like doing surgery on living flesh. A discipleship of decolonization invites us settlers to reread our people's stories mindfully, critically, and compassionately, including our own biographies with a commitment to healing and restorative solidarity. It is not about shaming or exoneration. And this is what the great writer activist Audre Lorde called doing our own work. I want to mention three last settler moves to innocence that are focused among progressives such as us. We imagine we can fix the violence of colonization through critical consciousness, such as giving academic papers at conferences like this. But there is no exoneration by conscientization. What counts are actual practices of personal and political transformation. Another move to innocence, long familiar to secularized Northern Europe and increasingly common in liberal North American society is that culpability for colonization rests solely with the history and systems of Christendom. So if we renounce Christian structures and traditions, we are somehow exonerated. But descendants of the victims of Christendom's crimes are not helped by settler descendants simply dissociating from their faith. Rather, they need people who will call the churches to accountability and engage in practices of repentance and repair. Indeed, the spiritual vacuum of post Christendom often leads to a last move to innocence the practice of appropriating the culture and ritual of other religious traditions or of indigenous ceremonies, which is just another expression of colonization. So these are some of the specific ways we see settler North Americans asserting their innocence to add to the map that you have drawn of Mennonites and innocence in Europe. Contemporary Indigenous activist Nikki Sanchez summarizes the whole matter simply and succinctly for settlers who want to move beyond innocence. This history is not your fault, but it is absolutely your responsibility. So how do we develop this ability to respond? In Canada, there is a popular and powerful trope that calls settlers to live into what it means to truly become treaty people. That is to finally heed the covenants that we made with Indigenous people. We think the ethos of covenant in our biblical tradition brings important resources to such a project. But we must also heal our history of hauntings. In our 2009 book, Ambassadors of Reconciliation, we explored how principles of restorative justice might be applied to historic and contemporary injustices. And in our new volume, we build this out, experimenting with a process whose goal is to animate and empower settlers in personal and political practices of restorative solidarity going forward as a path of healing, haunted, healing hauntings. Restorative solidarity consists of three inter interrelated commitments. One is we need to do our own work around issues like agnosia and dissociation, white fragility, ethnic loss and assimilation, and the impact of intergenerational trauma and moral injury in order to understand our own deformation by and entanglement in the legacy and structures of settler colonialism. Two, we need to listen to how Indigenous and other communities injured by historic and current injustices are identifying harms, needs, and responsibilities. And three, we need to work with these communities to make things as right as possible, including covenants of accountability, restitution, reparations, repatriation, and perhaps over time, even reconciliation. And so this process is an ongoing circle. It is a life work. And ultimately, it must lead to concrete expressions of redistributive justice. In the last section of our book, we explore four aspects of restorative solidarity. 
first revisioning our colonial legacy and identity, then relationship building with indigenous communities, especially our neighbors. Third, restorative actions that support work for indigenous justice and for reparative experiments. So I wanna give just one brief example of each aspect, but encourage you to think of how these practices might be contextualized among European Mennonites and other justice advocates. Our annual Bartimaeus Institute seats, seeks to create a space for reschooling, schooling ourselves, offering instruction, inspiration, and empowerment that engages not only our heads, but also our hearts and hands and spirits. So we focus on critical immersion in the landlines, bloodlines, and songlines of our faith traditions, especially scripture, of exemplary social movements, both historical and contemporary, and of our own lives. And here we gather with kindred spirits to do serious work at the intersections of sanctuary, seminary, streets, and soil. Curating such spaces is crucial so that we white settler Christians and others can deepen our journeys from denial to discipleship and to engage more deeply in the next three aspects of restorative solidity. Our mentor, Harry LaFond, emphasizes that relationship building is essential to solidarity. Former chief of the Muskeg Lake Cree Band and director of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner of Saskatchewan, Harry and his wife, Jermaine, are well known around Saskatchewan for how they have welcomed settlers to their reserve and shared stories and song and food and culture. But we have to show up and move beyond our comfort zone, be ready to learn. Third, it is crucial that we settlers learn this. We learn to listen to indigenous concerns and to show up in meaningful ways to support, accompany and stand with communities engaged in righting past and present wrongs. For example, many faith-rooted settler activists have marched with the native water walkers who teach in a traditional way the importance of eco-justice. In both Canada and the US, resource extraction is one fraught area of contestation from Standing Rock to Wet'suwet'en. So faith leaders have been active in demonstrations around pipeline justice. And the group pictured here includes two dear friends, a Mennonite leader and an Anglican priest. And they were responding to an invitation from the tsleil nation to stand in solidarity against the pipeline project. And ultimately, our practices of decolonization in North America must lead to redistributive justice, including reparations. The creation of land and life is considered the essence of decolonization by many indigenous leaders. The gospel story of Jesus and the rich man makes it clear that returning what was stolen is a precondition for the discipleship of all those of us who are affluent and for our healing. And we discuss this text at length in our book. We know the talk of reparation spikes our settler anxieties and that our communities and institutions typically dismiss it as too complicated or unrealistic. But we Christians can and must think and organize together with Indigenous colleagues concerning power, money, and land justice. The first Mennonites arrived in my home province of Saskatchewan beginning in 1892. As their population grew, the Canadian government confiscated treaty land from the young Chippewa at Apwashamo Trakatanao or Stony Knoll as settlers named it and gave it to Mennonite settlers. The tribe has since been landless and federally unrecognized. After a long struggle, to learn about this history, some Mennonites living in the area have joined in an effort to address this historic injustice. And we've had the opportunity to participate in educational and community building events at Apwashamo Chakatanao, as well as in an annual music and cultural event, which raises money for the young Chipewayan land claims and reconciliation efforts. 
Here in California on Chumash land, we're supporting friends who are reconstructing the language, monitoring cultural artifact, artifacts in construction zones and building tribal identity. Now, none of these examples of restorative solidarity are heroic. Indeed, attending demonstrations or modest redistributions of settler surplus are hardly costly. But such experiments represent beginning steps in a longer journey away from innocence and toward responsibility, which will in turn animate more substantial efforts. We must be persistent because this is about our healing. But we'll have to get used to working with questions that have no easy answers, something that is very difficult for us managerial minded settlers. Mohawk educator Hayayak Alfred sums it up this way For all of us, Indigenous and settler alike, there is only self questioning and embracing this commitment. Listen to the voices of our Indigenous ancestors channeled through the young people of our nations. Learn from Indigenous cultures how to walk differently and love the land as best you can." End quote. We believe this journey of decolonizing discipleship can heal our haunted history and lead us into a redeemed future of justice for all on Turtle Island. Thank you. <laughs>